As you can see today, this is what I'll be talking about, Australian psychoactive acacia species and their alkaloids. So acacia, firstly, just to clarify, acacia always used to be one genus relatively recently. It was decided rather controversially that the Australian species, or what are most of the Australian species, would become the new acacia. That's now, you can refer to that as acacia sensu stricto. Um, and we have all these other genera too, which, company, uh, which um, encompass acacias from other parts of the world. Uh, we, we don't have only acacias. Some of our species have been reclassified into Vicalia, but um, by and large, we'll be talking about acacia today in the uh, strict sense. So acacias in Australia, um, well, as you can see, the part of our coat of arms is the national floral emblem. The actual species wasn't actually set in stone until, I think, 1989. They decided it would be acacia pignantha. They had to choose one because there are uh, well over a thousand species of acacia. So they're very much part of the nat national consciousness. Now, this kind of thing was very much the craze 100 years or so ago. Um, it sort of illustrates the love Australians have for acacias. When they're in bloom, as you can get some impression from this picture, the um, the yellow and, and green really overtakes the landscape and it's, it's hard not to ignore it. So um, Australians feel very close to acacias, but so do other people in South Africa, and um, which is one reason why they weren't too happy about the change of the name. Um, so we already know that there are some obscure uses of acacias as psychoactive agents in other parts of the world, particularly Africa and possibly the Americas. Um, Everywhere else, we just have hints here and there. Um, in the Middle East, Africa and India, acacias are, are well known to have a, a very long history of being important sacred plants, which is never really elaborated on, but they appear a lot in mythology and art. And um, it's quite likely that these plants may have had a role in the development of early religions, certainly um, shamanic practices. But um, we can only speculate at this point. Uh, which people <laughs> do a great deal of on the internet. Uh, there's a lot that gets stated as fact, which is, is pure speculation, but some of these things may turn out to actually be accurate, but we just have no way of knowing. We're talking about things thousands of years in the past that were secret then, and they're even more unknown now. So in Australia, um, the continent's been populated for upwards of 60,000 years, and presumably for much of this time, Acacias have been used by the indigenous people for a wide variety of things. Um, so they're very much all round plants that are important to the, the whole cultural situation, uh, especially for food. Acacia seeds, uh, that's basically survival for some people. Um, and they're quite nutritious. These days people are rediscovering this. Acacia seeds are being used for, to be ground for flour to make food. Also as coffee substitutes, which we'll get onto later. Uh, commonly used as fuel, fish poisons, make tools and utilitarian objects, uh, also ritual objects. They use a wide array of medicinal purposes and also some ceremonial uses. Um, now I just need to explain, the indigenous people in Australia, since the country was colonised by white people or rather invaded, they've suffered indignity after indignity. They've um, had Massacres take place, they've had families broken up, children taken away, raised in missions, um, moved off their land. And the, these people have a very strong connection to their land and you take them away from their land and they're, they're lost, they're cast adrift. Um, you tie this in with all the other things I just mentioned and it's a recipe for a great deal of loss of knowledge of traditional ways. Um, it's a common thought that most traditional knowledge has been lost and any that exists today is just people trying to piece together the remnants of what their parents knew. Um, to some extent that is true, but not in all parts of the country. There is a lot of knowledge that has been passed on orally generation to generation. We, we don't know how far back this really goes, but um, there's a lot going on and a lot that we don't know about, a lot we're not told. Um, Many plants have sacred significance to Indigenous Australians, and um, 
Th this can mean a variety of things. It doesn't necessarily indicate that they're psychoactive plants that they're keeping hidden from us, but the wide array of very important ceremonial uses and uh, spiritual importance. For example, sometimes when important people in the community die, their, their spirit is believed to go into a, into a particular tree, and that tree will be regarded as sacred and embodying the, the spirit of that, that ancestor and the knowledge of that's passed on. But in general, ceremonial use of plants in Australia is something that is uh, kept very close to the chest. It's not shared with outsiders. It's not to appear in print. It's not to be discussed in public. And this applies to a wide array of different plants. I'm not just referring to acacias here. So that's an area that I can't go into. So um, I imagine a lot of you may be disappointed because maybe that's what you were hoping that I would go into, but that, that area is off limits. But I can give some examples of uses of acacias by indigenous people which can maybe hint at some possible psychoactive agents. Um, the smoking ceremonies. Uh, smoking in this sense, we're not talking about rolling a cigarette or smoking a pipe. This is basically a form of open air vaporisation. I guess you would say it's dirty vaporisation because you're getting partial combustion, but um, involves placing fresh plant material on some hot coals so that um, fumes and some smoke are produced. Um, a wide array of different plants are used for the, these purposes. Um, and this can be purely medicinal, which is perhaps the most common way. Um, they're also commonly used to, to open ceremonies or important meetings. Uh, people might smoke themselves before going away on a long trip just to um, give themselves protection and good luck. And perhaps um, most interestingly, a very wide practice, and this applies a lot to acacias, that they're used in smoking medicine for newborns when they come into the world. So in a way, their greeting into the world is to be bathed in, in often acacia smoke. Um, the mother usually takes part in this as well. Uh, here's an example. This is a person just smoking for himself. Uh, over to the right, we see a baby being smoked. Now, um, that baby doesn't look terribly fresh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but um, usually it will, be, it will be done quite soon after birth, and it also serves a purpose for the mother in some cases, depending on what plant they're using to help prevent um, postpartum bleeding. So there's a couple of the species that are very commonly used in that context for smoking babies. Um, <clears throat> chemistry of these species is rather poorly known. There's been a little bit of work done in more recent times. Nothing in the way of alkaloids has been reported. Um, but we'll, as we'll discuss later, alkaloid work on acacias in the, the realm of official research seems to have sort of disappeared. And I wonder why that is. Um, Anyway, th these plants have many interesting active compounds to be discovered, probably for medicinal purposes, maybe not so much psychoactive. We don't know about that. Um, these species, one or the other, may be used. Um, the sources I've, I've referred to are a bit uncertain about which species, which I find odd because they do look rather different. It's another species used in uh, smoking babies. And <laughs> That sounds terrible, smoking babies. I mean, it's, um, <laughs> you understand what I mean. Acacia palita. Um, now, this is a particularly interesting use. This is used in Groot Island, which is in the Gulf of Carpentaria, up in the north of Australia. Um, when children are running around and basically being a pain in the ass, mum will um, put some of this on the fire, hold the kids over the smoke, and um, <laughs> wait, wait for them to calm down, which strongly suggests there's some sedative activity going on here. Um, this species is unexplored chemically. Um, as you'll see, some of the species I'll be discussing with these uses, they have a, a, an array of different uses. Acacia polita, I just mentioned, also used as a painkiller. Now, many of these species used as analgesics. Um, I've listed here because often painkilling plants may be associated with some kind of opioid activity or sedative activity. Um, with all of these, we, we don't know if that's the case. Um, there may be sim simply um, anti-inflammatories, helping relieve pain in that way. Um, usually these are uh, used externally. The internal use of plant medicines in Australia is, is not common. The most things are applied externally, um, in which case a plant part would be heated over hot coals, make it sweat a little bit, and then you um, hold it to the affected area, um, maybe strap it on. 
there's two species. Lissa Floyer was one also used to smoke babies, but along with Montecola. Um, these two are heated and applied to the head, uh, the temples and the forehead, to ward off uh, annoying spirits. Um, we, we could be looking at a potential antipsychotic medicine. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot that really needs exploration, and with so many species to look at. <laughs> Who knows what might show up. These are a few of the species used as painkillers, just to illustrate. Which brings us to our next possibly interesting area. Um, this species is used both as a painkiller and also to stun fish. So, um, of course, this is not in Australia. This is the best picture I could find um, to illustrate just the general process of the way plants are used as fish poisons. Um, in other words, sometimes used like giant tea bags or plants are simply beaten and thrown into a water hole. People that you'll wait some time and the fish will come to the surface, not actually dead, but um, stunned. And they can be eaten safely. Um, now it's possible, of course, some, some species used as fish poisons do have powerful psychoactive chemicals in them. For example, pituitary is, is used in such a way. And you'd expect in those cases the alkaloids are playing a part in stunning the fish. As far as we can tell with the acacias, um, most likely what is going on is uh, tannins and saponins uh, simply asphyxiating the fish. So they, they, they come to the surface basically because they, they just can't breathe and they just go a bit funny for a while. Um, but, but this is all really poorly explored. I found it really hard to find any good data on this. Uh, most of the papers I referred to simply refer back to other people. You check their papers and they don't say what the other person said they said. And most of this goes back to research that was done in the late 19th century. For example, tannic acid was um, put in water in a very tiny concentration and was able to effectively um, kill fish. Here's a few of the species used and we'll be hearing more about some of these later. Now, pituitary and tobacco. Um, most people will have heard of pituitary. It's probably the best known Australian psychoactive plant. Um, pituitary and tobacco are generally used in the same sort of way. Uh, the plants are quickly cured over fire and chewed with ash that's made from a variety of species. And many acacia species uh, show up in this context. Other plants are used too to make the ash. Because of this association, uh, a lot of people have made an assumption that these acacias might also be psychoactive, but you know, realistically they're being burned to an ash mixed with this. You, uh, you're not going to be getting any effect from the ash. The ash is purely there as an alkaline agent to increase the absorption of nicotine. Usually um, the, the, the plant material would simply just be burned out over a bowl and the ash collected. There's no, there's no big deal in, in preparing the ash, although the actual methods haven't been recorded in, in all cases, so we've got limited examples to refer to there. This is just an example of some ash being mixed with the native tobacco. Uh, you only a very small pinch is needed. They need this in when it's damp. This is one of the species really commonly used for the ash, um, the mulga, acacia and neura. It's very variable, occurs over much of central Australia. Um, there's a high likelihood of this species containing interesting alkaloids, but uh, to the best of my knowledge, the, there are no studies on this yet. These are also highly favoured species. Actually, a salicina, um, the ash from this species was found to um, be highly alkaline um, compared to just random plants that were burnt. Um, it's very effective in doing the job. But interestingly, in the Lake Eyre district of South Australia, Acacia salicina is also known as pituitary itself. Um, generally, I don't know of any other plants that are ash plants, which are, are also called pituitary, which kind of suggests something, especially when you tie it into a, a, an obscure report from northern Queensland. Um, this was a, a white person telling another white researcher that the Aboriginal people in his area smoke the ash of Acacia salicina to become drunk and then they, ha they have a really deep sleep. Now, again, I would think that this is just a case of confusion. Um, I, I fail to imagine how you can actually smoke ash, given that ash is what's left over after you've smoked something. Um, it's most likely a confusion with pituitary just by someone who's observing these people doing something and they couldn't quite put their finger on it, so they, they, they made an assumption which was wrong. 
you know, more recent times, uh, white settlers, when they came to Australia, um, and explorers, they wanted to find things they could use as tea and coffee substitutes because these things were not that widely available yet in the colonies. Um, unfortunately, as in many cases with things used for this purpose, uh, there's no evidence of caffeine content or particularly any stimulant activity. Um, this first species was experimented with by Ludwig Leichhardt and, and his friends in the late 19th century. They, they came across a bunch of seeds that had been um, roasted by a wildfire and they decided to try them out. They all got violently ill. <laughs> um, this isn't often the case though. Many, many species have been used as coffee substitutes. They don't make you violently ill um, if they're you know, roasted appropriately. Um, they mainly fit this purpose because when you roast them, they do smell a little bit like coffee. They make a brew that's you know, deep and brown and tastes a little like coffee, but there's no caffeine. Um, Acacia seeds do contain a variety of different chemicals, um, but they're probably more likely in this context to be nutritious and tasty <laughs> rather than psychoactive. Uh, here's two species which have been used as tea substitutes. Uh, again, no indication of any caffeine or, or anything like that. Um, Acacia suave elements does contain simple phenethylamine alkaloids. It's, it's likely, or, or perhaps possible, I should say, that um, there may be some stimulant activity from that if you take enough of it. Um, it can contain very high levels of these alkaloids. Um, I haven't tried either, either of these. I, I wanted to try the Acacia de Currens, the early black wattle. Um, the, the, there was one in my yard. It's not indigenous to the area where I live, but um, unfortunately my wife cut it down one day because it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's not an indigenous plant to our area and she, she just thought it was a weed. So um, I didn't get a chance to try that out. And another big tree in my area recently got cut down for some development, so that's gone as well. Acacia suave olens, however, um, there's another species, Acacia itiophila, which is very easily confused with this. Um, I have tried Acacia itiophila as a tea, and it appears to have some mild stimulant activity. Uh, it tastes a little like Japanese green tea. Um, it's a dose of about one tablespoon of ground phyllodes. Um, that was simply infused like tea. I tried two tablespoons boiled and um, it didn't taste as nice. <laughs> um, but I didn't notice any great increase in the effects. Acacia georgiana has also been used as a tea substitute according to one person. Um, I'd be really reluctant to try this as this plant is known to sometimes produce toxic amounts of sodium fluoroacetate. Um, quite dangerous stuff. Um, I have to wonder if, if this report is maybe a confusion. There's another species, Acacia cambagia, which is also shares the same common name with this. It has a similar appearance, um, but apparently doesn't produce that compound. So this brings us up to the modern day. Now, um, in 1965, we have the first published report of tryptamines found in an acacia species, which was Acacia maidenii on the left. Uh, that was uh, Fitzgerald and Sumas published a paper in the Australian Journal of Chemistry. They found DMT and N-methyltryptamine in the bark of this species. And then two years later, coincidentally 1967, the, uh, the, day, the date of the, or the year of the original ESPD conference, uh, Acacia flobophila uh, was analysed by Ravelli and Vaughan and found to contain pretty decent levels of DMT itself. Now, for some reason, you would think if this information came about in the late 60s that um, people would have picked up on it and maybe used these plants to get some DMT. Of course, at that stage, DMT was still a very obscure substance, especially in Australia. It was probably better known in the United States and Europe. But even then, it was obscure. It's not something most people wanted to, to try. And as we know, that began to change around the late 80s, early 90s. And... Um, Yes, we entered a phase where people suddenly woke up to this. And one prompt for that was this work, Plants for Medicines, which came out in 1990. This was a government publication um, from the, the Commonwealth Science and Industrial Research Organisation. Um, they, they did an excellent compilation of the state of knowledge and chemical studies on Australian plants. But they also did a, a fresh analysis of Acacia maidenii and got similar results, but with a slightly higher yield. Now, this book, although it was 
a textbook. Um, it did show up in reference sections of some public libraries, and um, interested people such as myself <laughs> eventually found this book and could barely believe that it was actually stocked in a, in a public library. Um, this certainly put a few university types who were interested in these things onto the acacias. And um, in 1992, partly as a result of this and also going back to the original papers, a student at Sydney University was the, the first known person to extract alkaloids from acacia, from, from any acacia, for the express purpose of experimenting with as, as a psychedelic. Um, this information it took a year or two to, to eventually spread. The internet was still young in those days. Um, once it got on the internet, it never went away, and you can still find this reproduced all over the place. Um, the person responsible now leads a rather respectable life and uh, would rather not be um, associated with this. <laughs> um, so perhaps it's good that this person's name hasn't been widely reported. Um, now, shortly after that, 1993, very early 1993, have the first known example of people uh, doing a similar thing, but for an ayahuasca analogue. Um, several people went to Mount Buffalo where Acacia flobophila grows, and um, with what they collected there, they combined it with Syrian roux seeds and got um, very, very potent results. And this was also replicated by other people shortly after. Um, then uh, Jonathan Knott visited Australia and returned home with some samples and did his own experiments, uh, which were included in his book Ayahuasca Analogues, which came out in 1994. Um, so, of course, as, you, as many of you would know at this stage, the whole concept of ayahuasca analogues using non-traditional plants was still um, very obscure. There are very few people experimenting with these kinds of things. Um, there are a few people in the United States, some of which had um, reported on their results in the Entheogen Review. But this was you know, still extremely obscure knowledge to most people. It, it took a little while to trickle out on the, to, onto the internet. So, um, so the people who did this, you know, they're rather brave when you think about it. You're taking a plant that is, has no known history of human consumption, um, using relative guesswork to, to get the dose, just boiling it up and going for it. And, um, you know, they were lucky that they didn't happen to discover the plant contained something else that might have killed them, you know. Um, anyway, this set the stage. Um, throughout the 90s, illicit research into acacias really, really went crazy. Um, real, people started to look into it a lot. People started to exploit it a lot. Um, the first previously undocumented alkaloid-rich species, um, Acacia obtusifolia, was discovered by someone in late 1992 who was actually looking for Acacia made any eye, and he initially made a, a misidentification. It took a few years to, to sort that out. But he began using this plant for, for uh, tryptamine use from late 1992 onwards. And um, th this remained relatively secret for a few years. Uh, eventually it came out on the internet due to another person putting the, this info on the Lyceum website. Um, but around that same time, I mean, within a very small window before people finding out about this, the, the exploitation that, that just dived onto this plant was extraordinary. Um, already in 1996, people were noticing um, disturbing amounts of damage to wild trees from people just carelessly stripping bark just to, to get alkaloids. It created a very disturbing picture for people who thought that they were, they were helping um, by, by sharing their knowledge about these acacias. Um, so some people decided to um, just go back in their shells and not tell anyone anything. Um, after a while, you know, as these patterns continued, um, especially with the case of Flebophila, if I, I'll just backtrack a little bit, um, that species, it only grows in one place, Mount Buffalo in Victoria, and um, it, it's a rare plant. It's relatively easy to identify. So people really zoomed in on that one. That began to suffer damage. And Acacia made any eye. It's much more widespread, but it's more tricky for the amateur to identify. Um, it's quite variable. And, um, and even if you do have it identified right, there seem to be two forms, one of which often doesn't contain much in the way of alkaloids. So lots of people went out stripping bark from these trees. And um, often they weren't even getting any results out of it. You know, it's just senseless dest destruction, much of which led to, led to nothing. Well, that may have been a good thing because people started regarding acacia made any eye as being not that useful, so a lot of people just stepped back and left it alone, looked for other things. 
This is an example of some of the, I mean, this doesn't show the whole tree, but this is, this has been completely stripped of bark and that tree is now dead, that was a mature tree. Often acacias don't live for that long. Um, some may maybe only live for 30 or 40 years. Um, sometimes if they have good conditions and people leave them alone, they can, they can live for longer. But you know, th this is just senseless. Um, people are approaching these things purportedly to learn from them, and you know, this, is, this is how they get repaid. This kind of thing has made me really um, reluctant to do this talk. I've, uh, I decided to do it because I was hoping to, to help spread some of the knowledge people have learned to, um, to try and minimise this sort of thing. Um, first and foremost, um, underground researchers have found that often the foliage and small twiggy parts are quite sufficient for the needs. If you have a tryptamine containing species that you know is good, there's no need to go to the bark. Um, there's, you know, there's no need to cut down a whole tree. Um, you know, this is just pure greed if you're doing something like that. Um, alkaloid content often you know, might be higher in the roots than some species, but again, if you're digging up a, a tree just to get to the roots, um, you scum, basically. People should not be doing that, and there's just no need. The only motive is greed, really. Um, so, yeah, you can, use, you can use the tips off branches. You can, you can just do some light pruning on a tree and get as much as you need. Uh, also, people have discovered that the alkaloid content in many acacias is, is highly variable. Um, some species do appear to contain useful tryptamines all year round, but the... Um, the profile may stay more or less the same. Others, they'll contain useful tryptamines all year round, but the, the profile will vary wildly. There'll be lots of trace compounds which come and go at different times of the year. Um, a lot of this really needs to be researched more and, and, um, and looked into because this variation, uh, people sometimes think they're finding a pattern, then they discover something else which just destroys that pattern. You know, it's, it's, um, it's a very variable thing. You can't just wander out there and think, well, I read a paper that says this contains 0.3% DMT, so therefore I should be getting that from this plant. You know, it, it may not happen. Some trees also, most of the year, they'll contain more or less nothing at all in the way of alkaloids, and then there'll be just one season, season or maybe a period of a few weeks or a month in the year where they'll suddenly contain really high amounts of alkaloids. So some of the things people have been investigating and just uh, dismissing, they probably deserve further research. And it's perhaps a good thing that some of the species that exhibit this behaviour are actually introduced and have become weeds in other parts of the world, um, especially in um, Europe, Africa and, and Asia. And it's not all about DMT. This is what most people go for when they think of acacias. They think, oh, that's somewhere I can get some DMT or that's something I can use just as a substitute for another DMT-containing plant. Um, for example, you know, people want stuff to use in acacia. Um, so cochlear in Australia is not that available, so they, they, they would like to use, um, use acacia in their ayahuasca. Um, some species, this can be done, um, but you shouldn't assume that it could be done with all species. Uh, the alkaloid content's variable, but there are also other chemicals in, in acacias, and unless you know that something has been consumed safely um, by, by a large number of people, you should exercise extreme caution with consuming any of these plants. They are also known to produce uh, cyanogenic glycosides, so unless you're keen on cyanide poisoning, um, just be very careful with consuming fresh material. <coughs> but there are many other alkaloids in DMT that are also interesting. Um, and the, the, these mixed spectrum alkaloid extracts, some people actually much prefer them to pure DMT. Uh, uh, I know a number of people who um, are used to smoking mixtures which they think is just DMT because that's usually how it gets sold. Um, and then they get given something which is pretty much pure DMT and they say, no, it's missing something. It's, you know, I don't really like it as much. Um, or it's not as powerful. Um, although, you know, DMT is plenty powerful, but um, the acacia extracts are often, when they have a mixed profile, they, they seem to have a Let's say that they're easier to, to assimilate. They're still extremely powerful, but um, it feels easier to learn from them and actually bring something back. The, 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 these are very powerful healing plants we're talking about here. This is, this is not just a, a, a means to um, obtaining DMT. Um, one person discovered that N-methyltryptamine, and I should say that it's preliminary to believe that this is actually N-methyltryptamine. This was um, done with tests 
um, using compounds separated with thin layer chromatography from a plant known to contain that alkaloid mixture. Um, so this needs further confirmation, but preliminary results indicate that N-methyltryptamine, which has been thought to be more or less inactive, does seem to have some interesting psychedelic activity. Not as visual as DMT, but um, it takes a bit longer to come on. It lasts longer, um, but you also have to smoke a higher amount if you are, if you are smoking it. Um, if you're taking it orally in an ayahuasca situation, it's possible that N-methyltryptamine may have some um, more undesirable effects when it's taken with an MAO inhibitor. We're not really sure. Um, Acacia obtusifolia has been used in brews to some extent, but, but quite often people will remark on um, uncomfortable effects they don't like. I remember one person um, during a ceremony apparently proclaimed, this Aussie shit's got five MEO in it, and was you know, really annoyed because they, uh, presumably that they had tried that with um, an MAO in inhibition combination before and had very... Um, powerful, unpleasant effects, as is often the case. I've known people who taking 5-methoxy-DMT with, with harming, and some people thought it was lovely, other people thought it was the most horrible thing they'd ever done and would, would go around making everyone else promise not to touch it. Um, don't know, Mamo will know, <laughs> know what I mean. There was an event some years ago where this combination was being distributed. Many people were taking it. Anyway, moving on. Some alkaloid extracts that have small amounts of phenethylamines um, appear to, co to correlate with um, an extended duration when they're smoked, which is rather interesting. I mean, the amount of the phenethylamines in there, and we're just talking simple phenethylamines, like phenethylamine itself and, and methylphenethylamine, um, they're usually there in very low amounts. The tryptamines are dominant. Um, sometimes beta-carbolines are present in an extract, but um, whether they're there or not doesn't seem to affect this extended duration that I'm, I'm mentioning. And also, some species appear to be mildly psychoactive when uh, decoctured and drunk, chewed, or smoked. Um, it remains to be seen with, with some of these oral consumption acacias that are, that are active, it remains to be seen what's really going on there. Some of these we, we do know contain some beta carbolines. Um, flavonoids may also be playing a role here. Uh, you know, recent research over the last couple of decades has really been concentrating a lot on the properties of flavonoids in plants and the various effects they can have. And we do know some flavonoids apparently have MAO inhibiting activity. Um, to what extent this extends to humans rather than, than animal studies, we, we're yet to discover. Okay, so I just have to open up the second part of this. I divided it because, um, just for stylistic reasons, and there's a lot of information to deal with. So this is the next part of the talk here. Um, so in the genus Acacia, we have many different kinds of alkaloids, not just tryptamines. First and foremost, uh, phenethylamines are particularly known from some of the North American species. They also widely appear in Australian species here and there. <coughs> Generally, this is represented by phenethylamine, N-methyl, phenethylamine, uh, hordenine, and tyramine. Also, of course, the indoles, the tryptamines, and beta-carbolines. Uh, the tetrahydroisoquinoline alkaloid calicotamine has been found in one species from India. Uh, we have uh, histamine derivatives in a few species. Um, recently, have showed up a wide array of pyridines, pyrazines, and, um, and similar alkaloids. And uh, one species found to contain a spermidine alkaloid called acacine, which is yet to be um, fully characterised. Um, that came out in a, a master's thesis back in, I think, 1980. Um, the, the person, Nichols, and he proposed a structure for this alkaloid, but um, there's been no follow-up work at all, as far as I know. No one seems to be interested in what this alkaloid <laughs> might do. Also, many things in acacias that are not alkaloids to deal with, which people need to bear in mind when they're doing extractions or even with, with drinking these things. Of course, tannins is usually a very high tannin content in acacias, um, which can make things hard to keep down if you're drinking them. But some of these tannins, um, yeah, that with species that are orally active alone, the tannins may be contributing to this activity, and just in the case of flavonoids, 
Of course, tannins are very broad class that can include flavonoids and other compounds. There are tannins, flavonoids, saponins, terpenoids, etc. Heaps of different things in the seeds. And so now we'll go through all the species. Uh, I'll just be covering Australian native acacia species. We have a few introduced plants from other countries. I won't be discussing those. So this is the species that have been found to contain alkaloids um, or been found to have psychoactive properties which, with um, uninvestigated chemical content. There are a number of species that I'll be leaving out of this because, due to their rarity, um, but we still have plenty to look at, even leaving out those. So Acacia acanacea. This is a lovely little plant. It grows into a, a fairly small bush, lovely ornamental shrub, found to contain varying levels of um, mainly phenethylamine. I should mention here, when you see the name White, um, E.P. White analysed a great deal of leguminous plants in the 40s and 50s. Um, many of them were um, Australian acacias, but they, they, they were cultivated in New Zealand. So just bear in mind that um, in his analyses, unless stated otherwise, they were not grown on Australian soil. And I don't know if that would contribute to the chemistry or not. Um, there may be microorganisms that, that these plants need to produce certain, certain alkaloids that may be present in sorry, that may be absent in plants that are transplanted to other countries. That remains to be seen. Acacia cuminata, subspecies of cuminata. It's called raspberry jam wattle because that's what the wood smells like when it's fresh cut. Um, this is reasonably widespread, but it has, has suffered from visible um, harvesting for drug purposes, which has rather alarmed um, bush workers fond of their local areas and has even attracted police attention which is quite unfortunate. It's a beautiful species. Um, people first became aware of this in the late 90s, early 2000s. They kept it to themselves until more recent times. Now, early work on this mainly only found tryptamine, sometimes a bit of phenethylamine. The problem is with White's work is many of the species he looked at and he said that the tryptamine was the main alkaloid. Now we look at them again and we know that they contain a fair bit of DMT or, or NMT as well. Um, so you know, we should regard a lot of his results as not being definitive. And maybe some of the things he identified as tryptamine were actually um, DMT or, or a mixture of tryptamines that weren't properly characterised. So in more recent times, underground researchers um, have looked into this plant and gotten some, some good results. Um, and I should state here that um, in the last few decades, there hasn't been much at all appearing in the scientific literature reporting the findings of DMT in any acacias. Um, it's almost as though there's a, some unspoken consensus that this stuff is not really to be investigated further because they don't want to help um, drug users find fresh sources of, of DMT. Um, so that gap has, by necessity, been filled by um, people who are equipped with enthusiasm <laughs> and maybe some basic chemical equipment, but um, not much in the way of formal training or any formal facilities, definitely not formal approval to do any of this work. So um, a, lot, a lot of the results we'll be looking at from more recent years should be regarded as highly tentative and preliminary when it comes to identifying what's actually in there. But yeah, there are so many leads for further study. You know, if, if anyone wants to actually properly analyse this stuff and really um, get to the bottom, isolate the components and make sure that we know what's going on rather than just get a bit of a guess, that would be great. So Acuminata, yeah, often contains decent levels of DMT. Uh, one assay found mainly tetrahydroharman, um, as well as other beta carbolines, possibly a, a quinoline and um, smaller amounts of phenethylamines. <coughs> this species, some people have found to be mildly active orally, taken um, in a dose of perhaps 50 grams of phyllodes, lasting about an hour and a half. Um, this is not going to produce a full-blown ayahuasca-like effect, but, um, uh, uh, but still definitely noticeable. <coughs> This is closely related, uh, Acacia cuminata subspecies Burkittii. Um, this and Acuminata, they're, they're both very variable. Um, taxonomists are still debating about how to split them up properly. Um, the, the previous subspecies is also regarded to have four or five varieties at least, which um, taxonomists would like to 
classifies further subspecies, but um, that's still in the works. Uh, Burkittii, um, again, contains DMT and N-methyltryptamine. Acacia adunca, another phenethylamine containing species, rather high alkaloids, I mean 2.4 to 3.2 percent alkaloids. Um, <clears throat> the human activity of these phenethylamines is poorly known. There's been lots of work done in animal toxicity, but as far as um, what they do in people is, is really obscure. Acacia alpina, this also grows in the same mountain as Acacia flebophila, but it's not restricted to that mountain. It also grows in other alpine areas. Um, there's a bit of controversy. You know, many reports have found no alkaloids in the species. Some people claim to have um, brewed it up as an ayahuasca analogue and gotten good results, which would strongly suggest that there's DMT in it at least some of the time. This is a very delicate little, little species too. It's almost like the dwarf version of Acacia flebophila, but not quite. It's clearly very different, but um, it has similar shaped phyllodes, but Acacia flebophila, the phyllodes can get to around maybe so long, whereas this it's more like sort of that. It's, it's a good candidate for um, horticultural use as well if it can get into nurseries. Acacia auriculiformis, this one is very common in Northern Australia. Um, you'll notice as we go through this, a lot of these species you might think, well that looks like the one I just saw two slides back, but um, there's huge variation in acacias, but many of the distinguishing features are often due to you know, small things that we can't really see in a situation such as this. So you just have to take my word for it, these are actually all different species. Um, Tested positive for alkaloid content. Um, TLC assays by, um, by Appleseed and Trout tentatively found 5-methoxy DMT quite a long time ago, uh, which has never been followed up on. And again, I stress that's that, that is tentative. Very recently I found this paper, um, they didn't find any tryptamines or any other alkaloids that are usually known to occur in acacia, but they did find all these pyridines and pyrazines and pyridazinones all sorts of odd things that, um, to the best of my knowledge, these have never showed up in acacias before. Um, what they do in people is anybody's guess at this stage. Not an alkaloid, but interestingly, auriculocide, a flavan glycoside from this plant was found to have mild central nervous system depressant activity. And in rats, an extract was shown to improve memory in, uh, in tests. So again, we could be looking at some interesting um, therapeutic uses for these species. Acacia baleana, very, very common, uh, originally just from one small area of New South Wales. Now it's considered the weed in much of the rest of the country. <laughs> it's been spread as an ornamental and um, it just grows wherever now. So um, this is also found in, in other countries. Work back in the 70s by Repke and Co. Um, on plants growing in California found <coughs> Mixtures of tetrahydro, harman, and tryptamine at some times of the year, only tryptamine in other times, and then other times again, no alkaloids at all. So a great deal of seasonal variation there. And um, given that they're growing in California, I'm not sure if you can just flip that around for the Southern Hemisphere, um, but definitely further work needs to be done on this species. And I suspect that a lot more that will be found in it than just those two alkaloids. Um, it's a tentative detection of DMT which remains to be seen. Another person claimed to have obtained DMT from this species, but they gave a description of what the effects were like when they smoked it, and I can't see any reason to think that it was actually DMT this person obtained. But it is psychoactive. Um, people have claimed to smoke the leaves as a cannabis substitute and compared it to somewhere between cannabis and nicotine. I've tried this myself, and it, it does work, and it's surprising how little you need to smoke, um, given the, you know, I mean, the only known analysis there. Um, fairly low levels of alkaloids. I mean, a peak of 0.28%, that, that's reasonable, I guess, but yeah, you would think you'd need to smoke more than a, a very small amount to notice an effect from that. Acacia binervata. Um, this appears to contain DMT based on reagent spot tests compared with uh, the same test done on a Psychotria viridis um, comparison. <coughs> but again, sometimes people have found no alkaloids. Mm. Very common picture. Um, yeah, the, these plants are not making it easy for us, um, <laughs> which is probably a good thing that you know, not only do Indigenous Australians 
guard their secrets well, but um, so do the plants. Acacia buxifolia, this is another phenethylamine containing species, it's grown to some extent in horticulture. Acacia cardiophila, this one's lovely. Um, this definitely needs some more work. Uh, again, we have mainly White's work to rely on, in which he found um, some tryptamine and phenethylamine. It's a very attractive species, but um, I almost dread that if this does turn out to contain DMT because it's, it's a fairly spindly plant, doesn't grow all that fast and you, you're really not going to get much biomass out of it. Um, you could take a shrub around this high and probably crush it down to an amount of plant material that would fit between two hands. But it does have small spines, so you probably don't want to actually do that. Acacia caroli um, has been found to contain what would appear to be DMT based on the subjective effects of, of an extract. Now this species is um, it's not super common, um, it's not rare, but it's, it's, it should be treated with great care. I mean, the person who told the world about the species was a bit reluctant to share it, but it is on the public record, and um, he didn't object to me sharing this today. Acacia coli, this has been rumoured to contain good levels of DMT for quite a while. Um, most people who I've had contact with have had no luck with that. Um, claims go back to um, a fellow who, go, who goes under the moniker Dr. Carl. He's a well-known media personality in Australia. He's like a popular scientist who appears on, on radio to answer people's questions on all manner of things. He also has a website where you can submit questions. Um, this is a rather odd case. Someone wrote to him asking about um, whether petrol sniffing um, in indigenous communities has any connection to shamanic practices. And his answer to this, he, he, he dismissed that there were any shamanic practices in Australia and then for some reason w went straight to say that this species apparently contains high levels and, and gave figures and everything and I've got no idea where he got that information from or why he ignored all the examples that are well established already in the literature. But it's likely this does contain alkaloids of some kind at some time of the year in some populations. They just might not be tryptamines. We will see some other species later which are closely related to this and very easily confused. Acacia complanata. Uh, this was found back in the 60s to contain N-methyl tetrahydroharman as the main alkaloid. Um, people had hoped this might um, be like a native MAO inhibiting plant that they could use as a, an acacia combination. Uh, attempts to do so with alkaloids extracted from this plant have not been successful in orally activating DMT. But after having consumed the extracts, uh, some people have found that smoking DMT, um, the, the, the effects are potentiated and extended. And it appears to have sedative activity based on one bioassay of a 20 gram decoction of phyllodes. There's a claim of DMT in the bark, but um, no one's followed up on that as far as I know. And, uh, it remains unconfirmed. Acacia concurrens is also quite common in, in northern parts of Australia or in the, the, um, the northeast. It's part of a group that all used to be confused, and even today people find these rather tricky to tell apart. Um, Acacia crassa, Leo calyx, and Longus picata, all confused with Acacia concurrens. Um, an evaporated extract of this plant. Uh, had tryptamine-like effects taken orally with an MAO inhibitor, but we um, as, as yet don't know what's actually in it. Culture, Acacia cultriformis, this is uh, really common in flower arrangements, it's a very decorative, decorative plant. <coughs> it's been found to contain varying amounts of um, phenethylamine, sometimes tryptamine, and um, most likely contains other things. There's a tentative finding of 5-methoxy-DMT in, in various parts. Uh, that was with thin layer chromatography. That remains to be confirmed as well. It would be good if people could try and focus on plants like that that are relatively common or are cultivated a, little, a lot rather than going out to the, the more wild species that um, are more susceptible to, to over-harvesting and damage. Acacia cyclops, um, yeah, the South Africans here today might know this one, in fact I'm sure they would. Uh, this is an Australian species which has been introduced to South Africa and is now considered the weed there in some areas. And people both in South Africa and Australia have tried to extract alkaloids from this species and um, had some level of success. 
sometimes obtain no alkaloids, but when they have obtained alkaloids, the, there's, there's something there that appears to be psychedelic. It's not as visual as DMT. My guess would be there's decent levels of N-methyltryptamine sometimes in these extracts, but there's currently no actual analysis, even, even basic um, underground analysis on that one. Acacia delacchiana is another one that's been rumoured for years. Um, some people have had success obtaining what appears to be DMT from this species. Other people have had no luck at all. And of course, with a lot of these, you, you're relying on amateurs reporting on the internet what, the, what they've found, and you have to take their word for it if they don't provide photos that they have actually identified the plant correctly. You know, there's so many uncertainties with this, but it, it's sad that we're in a situation where we have to rely on such unreliable knowledge because of course, DMT is illegal. Extracting DMT from plants is illegal. Um, yeah, it would, be, it would be great if this weren't the case. I'd love to live in an open world where we could just study all these things without any fear of prosecution or persecution. Cacia deobarda is one of the very common species. Uh, especially where I live, this is super abundant. It practically grows as a weed. It sends runners under the ground and just pops up all over the place. And, you know, I have to go around pulling the stuff out because it's just, it just will cover everything if, if it wants to, um, if, you, if you give it the opportunity. Most of the time people have found either no alkaloids or very small amounts of alkaloids in this species. Um, at least one person has claimed to get DMT out of it, I, I should say two actually. Um, although most of the time this plant appears to contain no alkaloids. Just based on, um, for example, a taste test, which is one thing that people use to try and narrow down the field of inquiry, just tasting a small bit of the bark or the leaf to um, compare with known tryptamine-containing species to see if there are similarities. Some people have gotten good results with narrowing things down this way. Um, I've noticed the, the bark on trees growing at, at my place um, appear to be very bitter in, in January, which is um, summer in our part of the world. And other times, they're not really bitter at all. You can just taste the tannins. But this is well worth looking into. Um, yeah, plants growing in Portugal were found to contain very high amounts of alkaloids. Um, and as is the case with most papers you'll see these days, where people analyse an acacia and publish it in the journal, um, they will detect some amount of alkaloids or not, but they won't go the next step and actually even attempt to identify them. Or if they have, you know, this remains unpublished. You know, I get the feelings a lot of people out there are withholding their results just because of the, um, the stature of DMT in this day and age. Acacia deformis appears to contain some tryptamines. Um, it was initially misidentified as Acacia implexa. Um, some of the paperwork has been um, mixed up with this, so things are currently being revised, so I can't be more specific about that. Um, but hopefully we'll, we'll hear more about that species in the future. Acacia effusifolia, N-methyltryptamine and DMT. Uh, plants that are growing in an exposed situation seem to contain more DMT than NMT, and uh, Nor Harman also showed up in those situations. Acacia elata, this is another ornamental species. It can go weedy. I'm not sure if it's in any other countries, but um, even in Australia, it's, it's known as a weed in areas where it's not indigenous. Now, most of the time, people have um, found no alkaloids in this and older alkaloid screenings. Um, there are at least two cases of people obtaining extracts from this species which were strongly psychedelic. Um, oh, I should rather say one of them from a... Um, plant that had just flowered. The extract was, was quite powerful, um, but um, not, not really visionary, but it, there was still a, a strong healing presence there. Um, alkaloids obtained at other times, very powerful indeed. Um, the person who did this sent them off to get analysed by GCMS and they found, or well, they reported finding DMT, 5-methoxy-DMT, and methyltryptamine and formal tryptamine, which was um, particularly tentative out of all of those, and unspecified beta carbolines. This is a very beautiful species. You can't really tell from, from this particular image, but it's, it's got a very prehistoric feel. Like, uh, when you encounter it face to face, it feels like something that could have been around when dinosaurs were walking the earth. It may not have been, but it, it feels that way. Acacia excelsa. Uh, we have a tentative finding of 5-methoxy-DMT and, and many other tryptamines that were not identified. K. 
Acacia falsata, again, most of the time it compares to contain hardly any alkaloids at all, but what is there? One person did an extract and um, noted that when they smoked it, it was uh, definitely quite strongly psychoactive, but not psychedelic. They found it rather hard to describe. It was sort of odd. Um, people should probably be cautious with this one. It might turn out to be quite toxic. We, we really have no idea what's in there at this stage until further work is done. Acacia floribunda, very widespread, um, much grown in horticulture. You'll find this in parks and gardens in southeast Australia quite a lot. Very beautiful species, also quite variable. Lots of people argue on the internet about what and what isn't this species. Um, older work by White found um, <coughs> mainly tryptamine as well as phenethylamine in the species. But more recently, we found that it uh, nearly always contains low to moderate amounts of DMT and N-methyltryptamine. Um, people have used this for extracting alkaloids, and um, I know one person who's, who made a, a tea just with this plant by itself and said that it had some mild activity. Um, I'm yet to try that myself. It's, it's, it has a lovely gentle energy, this plant. It's a bit of a close-up. You can see it's covered with all these fine apressed hairs. Not that that's not a diagnostic character necessarily. Other species do have that as well. Acacia harpophila, um, good, really good amounts of, of phenethylamines in here, particularly hordenine and phenethylamine. And of course, hordenine's seen some use in the, the, uh, the world of supplements in recent times. Acacia holoceracina. Again, um, similar, we find hordenine in pretty large amounts, although sometimes it appears to contain no alkaloids. Um, this species and others uh, like it are really widely confused um, with Acacia coli, Acacia neurocarpa. Um, it can be hard to tell exactly what's been analysed sometimes when you see these in the literature because you have plants that were all considered to be one thing when in the time in which they were analysed and now we know that, that that group actually comprises numerous quite different species that, that cross over. Um, so we can't be entirely sure that the species they analysed here um, was actually what they thought it was. Acacia ketowellio, uh, we have phenethylamine and n methylphenethylamine. Acacia latior. Um, some specimens of this contained n methyltryptamine and DMT, but um, many didn't have any observable tryptamines at all. And this is um, all plants sampled at the same time from a patch. Like many acacias, very variable in morphology and alkaloids. I mean, you can you say that for the entire genus, really. Acacia leocalyx, subspecies leocalyx. Um, some people have managed to obtain what appear to be tryptamine alkaloids, um, unidentified at this stage. And other people have not had any luck. Again, we, yeah, we're most likely looking at a lot of seasonal variation in which there'll be um, you know, good levels of alkaloids at some times of the year and not at others. Acacia leptostachia. We have n cinnamoyl histamine in this species. This doesn't show up very much in acacias, but this is one of the few where it does. Acacia longifolia, subspecies longifolia. Um, now, White's work found predictably tryptamine and phenethylamine in the species. Um, other researchers have found a variety of histamine derivatives, usually in fairly small amounts. Um, we also see from this species, sometimes alkaloids show up in flowers. Um, it appears that sometimes when plants are flowering, the, uh, at least in the case of acacias, the alkaloid levels in, in the rest of the plant are lower. Um, it may be because they're migrating to the flowers, we don't know, but sometimes flowers have been found to contain very high levels of alkaloids. There are no reports of um, DMT yet in flowers, but I think that's just because people haven't looked for it properly. Okay. Uh, but people have found DMT in this species on occasion. Um, again, this is very variable. Uh, you might find it in some areas, not in others. Some people have used it in ayahuasca analogues, um, at least you know, from a limited area. I'd 
be you know very reluctant to suggest that anyone do the same unless they're really sure what was in it because there's so much variation in this one. And subspecies Sephori, very similar picture. We have you know histamine derivatives, but um, occasionally people manage to obtain DMT from this one too. All very variable. And those two subspecies, they overlap to an extent that is just so confusing. You know, even trained botanists get um, get stumped when where those two overlap. Longissima, another apparently useful DMT-containing species, at least some of the time. Similarly with Maybelli, uh, it appears to contain tryptamines, definitely psychoactive from a sample that was uh, extracted, but um, we have no idea what's actually in there. We already know about Madeni, I'll, I'll, just, I'll skip forward a little, seeing as we're short for time. Cation Mernsia, I like with Diobata, a very common species, often contains no alkaloids at all or very little. Um, I know of two cases where people have gotten really high levels from plants growing in Victoria in, in uh, December. Uh, one of these people went back to the same tree he'd used uh, a few weeks later and got nothing at all out of it. And yeah, this is uh, introduced, so it's now weed in Europe in some parts, so um, that would be a relatively sustainable thing to focus on. Similarly with melanoxalon, very widespread, very variable species, often has no alkaloids at all. Very, very occasionally you hear a report, someone says they actually got some luck with this one, obtaining DMT. Um, again, we have the, the, that same Portuguese study, they found very high levels in this, but they did not identify what was there. Cation macronata subspecies longifolia, this is another one that's sometimes orally active on its own to some extent. Um, but also, yeah, very variable in the chemistry. We have a whole range of um, recent studies. This is all um, underground work. Um, really wide variety of, of alkaloids, tryptamines, beta carbolines, phenethylamines. The exact makeup of all these you know, seems to vary from specimen to specimen or even on the part of the plant. Let's close up at the flowers just for you. Interest, you don't see acacia flowers close up very much, usually you just see them as these fuzzy balls from far away. Acacia uh, multisiliqua, sometimes DMT and NMT found in this one, but um, yeah, often no tryptamines in other samples in the, in the same area. Acacia myrtifolia, this is the one with the casein, the spermidine alkaloid that we don't know anything more about. Acacia <coughs> neurocarpa. Um, some people say this contains DMT, as, uh, but it's also widely confused with, um, with other species such as Acacia coli and uh, Acacia pellita, which we looked at much earlier in the talk, which um, deserves some chemical analysis. Uh, neurophila, again, DMT sometimes, um, <laughs> often no alkaloids at all, but the occasional specimen might, might give some results. Acacia obtusifolia, we've, um, we've discussed to some extent. This usually contains mainly DMT and N-methyltryptamine. You have a wide variety of um, um, morphologies of this and also yeah, different chemistry. People have debated for years whether this contains bifodenine or 5-methoxy-DMT. Um, um, to date, some analyses have, have shown up um, tentative presence of bifodenine. Um, no 5-methoxy-DMT has been determined in this species yet. Most of the time it appears to be mainly DMT and NMT. Of course, all of this will be in my paper in much greater detail, so if you'll be getting the, the volume later, you don't need to strain your eyes trying to read all this. Um, so, I think we need to... Well, if we wind up, there's just one very important thing I want to say at the end. I've got a prepared statement, actually, so if you don't mind me reading off of this, um, just to close up. Um, the recent growth of interest in acacia species as a source of DMT reflects a growing interest in consciousness expansion and direct spiritual experience that's been occurring globally for some time. And you know, this is generally a good thing, of course. However, this increased interest has also brought with it greed and commercial exploitation. And many users of acacia alkaloid extracts have no idea of the source of what they're using. To them, it's just DMT, and that's all they care about. They don't really have any interest in the plants. Um, they, they just blindly assume that it must be sustainable because the stuff keeps on, on coming. Um, 
Some of the species being commercially and legally exploited are extremely rare and may be threatened with extinction in the wild if current practices continue or increase. And regardless of the, the legality of this, this will continue, but um, it's hoped that people doing so can learn to tread lightly and discreetly in, in a way in which has not often been the case. And if these substances are shared respectfully through friends with no profit motive and people cultivate plants and use sustainable harvesting methods, then scenes of killed trees, like I showed you earlier, uh, should hopefully be a thing of the past. And I'd like to call for DMT users to boycott the sale and purchase of acacia extracts, um, and also plant parts, which has disturbingly been appearing on, on the black market, um, and to try to show you some respect to the plants they're trying to learn from. Um, these things are to be shared you know, with great respect and love, and um, the, for these things to become a commodity is just it just makes me so angry I want to explode. <laughs> so um, that brings us to the end. Um, thank you very much.